Welcome back to another week here on MWO Sports. Ryan Drury, I will be joined as always by Clarky and Steve Sabrin. Great show lined up as we chat with former Toronto Maple Leafs general manager, the youngest general manager ever, as a matter of fact, Gord Stellick, who is now a morning show host with NHL Network Radio on Sirius XM. We'll chat with Gord about the Maple Leafs, the North Division, the NHL overall, COVID problems, and much, much more. And then, of course, we will dig into the Super Bowl. Tom Brady wins a seventh. Trevor Bauer signs a massive deal in baseball. We'll touch on those topics with our buddy Chris Abbott from CoolBet coming up next. You're listening to and watching MWO Sports brought to you by CoolBet.co. This is MWO Sports. Welcome back to another week here on MWO Sports. Ryan Drury joined as always by Steve Sabrin and Chris Clark. And we are very pleased to be joined by another great special guest, Gord Stalick, who's the morning show host on NHL Network Radio on Sirius XM. You can also catch him on the fan as well, doing Leaf content. Gord, how are you? Ryan, I'm great. How are you doing? We're doing well, man. Sifting through this pandemic world together. And uh, I wanted to ask you just uh, off the hop what you've made of the play in the pandemic uh, riddled NHL world so far. There are a lot of guys on the COVID list. I mean, the NHL said to postpone a lot of games, but just in terms off the hop on the play that you've seen so far, particularly in this North division where the Leafs are really dominating, what have you made of the level of play so far? You know, you know, Ryan, and first of all, it's just been great, the sports. I mean, it's our escape, whether we work in the business or not. It's it's nice to nice to see that and be able to enjoy the games. I've heard so many people saying how much they love the hockey. It's like the old six-team NHL, even though it's seven or eight teams. So I really think it's been, for unintentional reasons, successful to create that kind of rivalry. Now, talking to Dave Poulin this morning from TSN, it, it is kind of now that because he was mentioning, you know, you've got some teams now with four games against the same opponent that, you know, we're loving it, the intensity. But then, say if you're Montreal or Toronto, you're saying, boy, it'd be nice to play Boston or Tampa Bay again. Uh, it, it's kind of great not being the Atlantic Division that we don't have to face the President's Trophy winners and the Stanley Cup champions, but it'd be nice to kind of test that way. So uh, so as much as it's great, I think it'll it'll have probably some negatives that way, but I'm loving the hockey. I'm loving the rivalries. It's, it's got a bit of a playoff feel. Or let's talk about our Maple Leafs, at least my Maple Leafs. Yours, yes, too, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so they've they they're now five points up on Montreal. Uh, is this team as good as it appears? Uh, should this team run away with this division? Uh, let's start there, and we can talk about the cup later. Well, yeah, you know the cup. Oh, yes, yes. Well, you know, Chris, uh, it's it, it's funny because once you got in this division, you said, "Oh, great, no no more Tampa Bay, no more Boston." So about finishing first is really reasonable. So you got the North division that has, it's anyone's division. So the Leafs should be the best team in the division. So they should come in first place. And then on the flip side, except for Ottawa, you're going to have two teams that are really pissed off. They didn't make it like two fan bases that are going to be really irate. You're already seeing it in Vancouver um, a little bit that way, if they end up being one of those two teams, but you know, Clarky, I love it that the, the, like last year, this was the way the Leafs we thought would play last year. Mike Babcock was going to coach them. They'd get to that next level in the regular season, and the playoffs would make or break it for Mike Babcock. They didn't get going. It was a dysfunctional year. It was a dysfunctional play-in series. And this year, they seem to, and I give Sheldon and Keith a lot of credit, Chris, about getting things right and, you know, like getting the new guys involved, give guys like Matthews Marner getting a little bit older. Like he said, it was an immature team off the ice. And I think what he meant last year, they didn't quite get what it took that you got to go and set a certain standard and find ways to win regular season games to set the table to win in the playoffs. And they're doing that so far. So do you think they've addressed the needs that we thought they needed to address in the offseason, getting tougher and and harder to play against? Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny that for a couple of years they fought that, and Brendan Shanahan is the president, and that's the way he played. And it was funny that he supported that kind of style. You said, no, you just need a little bit – it's not, you need a little more grit. You need a little more grit. You don't need Fraser McLaren decking a guy on the opening game like happened years ago, whatever. And and they did that. And then the other part, it was kind of a two-pronged sword, two-edged sword that you said, great, we got all this leadership. And you're going, great. They go, wait, why do you need all this leadership? Does it reflect on a lack of leadership in the past? And I think it did. So I think the new guys, Thornton, Simmons, even though they're hurt, but, you know, and, and Bogosian and Spezza coming back, 
have added it, but also give credit to the younger guys to kind of rise into Sheldon Keith's challenge. I think after Columbus, that seriously said, yeah, guys, we can't do this. This, this isn't fun. This is old. This is old all of a sudden, and we really got to get our bleep together. You know what, Gord? It really seems to me over the last few games that uh, they don't seem to be pressured, meaning you don't have Austin Matthews or Mitch Marner trying to do everything by themselves. Um, does that lend itself to the veteran presence in the dressing room and, and letting guys know that they have each other's backs? Yeah, you know, Steve, that's probably part of it. But here's the other part I like about this. Like, you look in the summer when they played Columbus, there were two games that Sheldon Keith basically did when someone's coaching a 10-year-old, 10-year-old hockey and they just want to win. They cut it down to two lines, right? They shortened the bench down to maybe one line. He had a couple of games. He only played two lines. He said, I'm getting nothing from my third and fourth line. Like, I'm getting nothing. So this year, he's kept moving guys in. And, I mean, guess again, last night, great effort by the fourth line. It doesn't matter who comes. So I, I, I like the way that's been raised. And part of it, to your point, is those new guys coming in. And, and they didn't – like, like he put him in good spots. He put Joe Thornton on the first line. You know, he, he put gave the guys power play time. He gave Jimmy VC a chance on a, on a prominent line. Babcock last year just kind of said, uh, yeah, uh, Tyson Berry, uh, yeah, I'm not big on him. You think he's going to succeed? Not bloody likely. Jason Spezza, I'm actually going to, I'm going to, I'm going to sink this one before training camp even starts and I'm going to embarrass him on opening night by not even dressing him and all that. So, you know, the a complete 180 that way. So I think the new guys help, but it's, it's the old guys buying into it and getting the depth. That's been huge. We're chatting with the morning show host on NHL network radio on Sirius XM, Gord Stalick and Gord, of course, you're a former general manager and executive yourself. One of the youngest GMs of all time, as a matter of fact of Clarkie's beloved Toronto Maple Leafs. I, I want to pick your brain and put your GM hat on here so far. I mean, I know we're still early in the season. We haven't hit the halfway mark yet, but what you're seeing out of Toronto and there's a lot of positives, but you see Wayne Simmons go down and he was adding an awful lot in terms of physicality and get up and go. Uh, to the lineup. When you look at the Maple Leafs right now and you think about, hey, maybe we have an opportunity to go on a deep playoff run when we have to play teams from our division for the first two rounds, they could conceivably get to a conference final. What would you say this lineup still needs to potentially add in terms of trades, which is going to be an interesting thing this year with the whole cross border thing. What do you see on this lineup that they would need to address to really, really push them over the top in your mind? Now, Ryan, first of all, I consider myself still the youngest general manager at age 30. John Chaka was 28, but it's Arizona. Come on. It's Arizona. My 90, <laughs> my, my 94 year old aunt Peggy could go in Arizona and run that team for a bit. So she could. Yes. So my, my joke has been that I was the youngest general manager in NHL history. And then 18 months later, I was the youngest ex general manager in NHL history. So uh, two records that I have, but uh, the, you know, it's funny as we get ahead to the playoffs though, Ryan, and we think of, again, this, I don't say assumption, but your, your belief that, okay, they win one series, win two series, and now they're in the final four again, which one Canadian team's promise, so at least that's a start. But what if they're the Tampa Bay Lightning of two years ago? Like, what about the phenomenal regular season they had in the ugly first-round exit to Columbus? And, of course, last year they bounced back and win the Stanley Cup. Like, what if that's the first round for the Toronto Maple Leafs? Like, what if they kill this division? And so I, I'm hoping they don't. I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, again, like you say, what they do is it will trans, you know, transpires in the playoffs and that they're able to do that. And then, you know, your point about like, I think St. Louis showed it two years ago, whatever you want to call it, heavy hockey. You know, you needed the heavy hockey and the Leafs did not have the players for the heavy hockey. You know, four lines of it to get through four playoff rounds. And this year, Wayne Simmons, Wayne Simmons is an excellent example about that guy that gives you an option that way to include in playing in playing heavy hockey. Gord, I've flip-flopped on this topic, oh, a dozen times in the last year or so, or even more. Freddie Anderson, he seems to be on his game again. He seems, when I, when I see him and he's nice and quiet in the net, he's not flopping around and not chasing the puck, he seems to be really on the ball. Last night against Montreal, first goal went in, but then he just shut the door. He's in a contract year. Can this guy lead the Leafs to the promised land? Well, he's lumped in with the other guys just as much because I'm really bullish on Freddie Anderson. I'm really bullish on Freddie Anderson. I love that trade. I mean, goaltending-wise, 
the, the Leafs have not developed someone internally since Felix Botvin. They haven't. Mm -hmm. They haven't. You know, and James Reimer was the best, and he was kind of the accidental one that just filled in when, you know, Justin Pogge didn't work out or other guys did not work out that way. But Freddie has what ails the Toronto Maple Leafs. Like, you love those – you know, we, we, you know, you, you always talk like Elizabeth Manley back in 1988. I know I'm dating myself, but she wins a silver medal at the Olympics. She comes up. She was not expected to, which was very un-Canadian skating because usually we win the world championships and struggle in the Olympics. But she just kicks ass. She had her best outing by a country mile and won the silver. So she on, on the biggest stage, she had her best event ever. And that's what the Leafs have struggled with. And Freddie is a great example. Like like we think of. You know, hey, Boston Bruins, game seven. Hey, why not have your worst game you can ever have in the first period? You know, just whatever, on and on and on. You know, it goes to game five against Columbus. So the games that you've really needed him to come up big, the money games, he hasn't done it. And that's what he's going to have to prove this season. The contract year is the contract year. I mean, it's it's going to be – there will be goaltenders out there. There will be goaltenders out there. But uh, uh, I, I just think that's the next step. He's the guy that, you know, like think about think about when they played Ottawa. And how Eddie Belfour or Cujo stole series. Like the Ottawa Senators were a better team. And every mm -hmm. year they went home crying, a big reason, because Gary Roberts kicked the crap out of them, but also goaltending. So that's that's the next level, Freddie. And he's one of many that has to has to show in the playoffs. Uh Gord, let's stretch it out a little bit uh from Toronto to some of the other centers. Uh Montreal's performed well. Edmonton is starting to catch some steam. Um but when you look at the North division as a whole, what is a, a team that you've been surprised by and a team that has been a disappointment? Well, I'll start with uh, Montreal still, even because, because, you know, Steve, last year when the pause happened, Montreal Canadian fans were still saying, we're going to a couple of years away from the playoffs. Right. And, and, and it's funny. They were, because when, remember the bubble was a little bit in doubt. They had to talk to some players and, you know, Montreal was one of those teams Montreal was not, despite how well they played in the bubble, they were one of the least keen teams to come back because they probably, some of them probably thought they'd get their butts kicked and get out of there. And really, they were playing for no money in the summer. It was like, you know, double the playoff money share, which isn't. So it's funny, they came in and they really just established where they could go to the next level. And uh, uh, again, a year ago, uh, you ask any Montreal Canadian fan, Mark Bergevin made zero good moves ever. And now the guy can do no wrong. And I, I love... I love the way he's put this team together, even a piece like Josh Anderson, like just I when I say even that, because just again, all those guys leaving Columbus is a little puzzling, but anyway, all those kind of things he's done. So I, I continue to be a little bit surprised and, and happy for their success on the Edmonton, by the way, come on. Like, you know, if you got Leon Dreisaitl and Connor McDavid, like I don't, again, I'll move Aunt Peggy from managing Arizona to playing the, come on, come on, come on we got to get those guys to the playoffs. Like how many years, what is this, your fourth five-year plan? Anyway, whatever. That's uh, They're lucky Connor McDavid has bought into it. What is it, minus 37 there today and all that. Disappointing team. And it's 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 an interesting one, the Vancouver Canucks, because I, I know they miss Markstrom and Tanev, but Braden Holpe is a real solid goaltender. Nate Schmidt was a, a good guy to get back the other way. And they're just kind of in that kind of funk. So, and then – and then people talk, is, is something a little bit amiss? Are there one or two players that are, you know, you don't want to start pointing fingers who they may be, but, you know, Brayton Holby was Holby was glaring at JT Miller after that uh, last goal there, you know, and he's he's moved from a couple of teams. And there's, you know, I don't, but just that kind of stuff seems to come to the surface when you're struggling. I, I just love their talent up front and their youth up front. And, and they're really right now in dire straits. Gord, you bring up Vancouver, and I mean, I would agree. I think I'm extremely disappointed in them. I mean, I'm not a Vancouver fan. I don't have a, a dog in the race in terms of the North Division, but I expected to be way more entertained by the Vancouver Canucks. You know, I'll ask you to put your management hat on again. What do you see, you know, as the future of this team in the short term? Because I think Canucks fans are kind of sick and tired, much like Edmonton fans, of hearing about rebuilds, and we've got to wait a couple of years. Jim Benning been there for seven years now is he going to still be there if they don't make the playoffs at the end of this year and what do they do if they change direction you know Ryan it's funny you say that the Jimmy Benning was an 18 year old when I worked with the Leafs right so uh, uh so and he's got the Aquilinis who are pretty hands-on emotional owners so as a general manager 
Um, I check my call display and I fear whenever the owner calls right now, I think if I'm Jimmy Penning, what gives, but uh, the, uh, you know, uh, I, it's, it's funny. You can't, you can't get panicked into a particular kind of move that way. Uh, it's sometimes it's just about, you've got to get out of it organically and you've got to look at the positives that they played well against Toronto in that third game. They really did. And, you know, you can, you can flip that switch and, and get going. And and again, if, uh, you know, it's it, like we look at Columbus that, that uh, right away, Patrick Lane comes there and already John Tortorella uh, is the hard ass about, you know, putting him on the bench there. So in Vancouver, if something's amiss that we were, cause I was the, 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 the big line, Ryan is always the dressing room is real. It's real uh, beyond coaches, beyond general managers, whatever about what is going on, what's not going on. And, um, if there's something deep and dark, like, hey, Tony D'Angelo's out of New York, you, you think there's any, any, is it any coincidence that all of a sudden they're starting to play better? And the guys can say all they want that we like them. We like them. Well, yeah, but you like certain people, but you don't want them on your team, you know, after, after a point. So it's so uh, save for that, which Jim Benning or Travis Green may look to address. Otherwise, hey, it's not a tough division. Ottawa, you can kick their ass. And really, if you're, if you're on fire there, you're, about as good as any team there except for Toronto. Gord, I've, uh, we worked together for 10 plus years, probably at the fan. And I don't think I've ever asked. I don't you this remember. Question. I don't, I don't remember. You don't remember me. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any ambition to, to be a general manager again? By the way, Clark, you got me, you didn't just work there. You got me in, you got me filling in co-hosting primetime sports uh, when Bill Waters was co-hosting with Bob McCallum. So I'm always grateful for that. Um, it's funny about being on the management side to answer your question. Yes. So it's interesting with all that's happened with Brian Burke, who's uh, mm-hmm. uh, er- everybody says they're a great friend of Brian Burke. Okay. So I'll add to it, whatever, you know, he's, he's going to have a great funeral, I guess, with all the uh, friends he has out there. But uh, you know, I asked the same question of Dave Poulin this morning because there's a similarity mm-hmm. there. And uh, it's, so to answer your question, uh, I mean, the ship has sailed for me because I came and all of a sudden, it was weird stuff like doing a little bit on the fan, uh, doing that ringside show with Rick mm-hmm. Hodge on the American Hockey League, and 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 then sports media really started bur- burgeoning and out of the sudden. So I was very fortunate to catch the wave with my second career. So I became a broadcaster. And, you know, it's kind of like Craig Button is right now. Mike Feud is kind of going to face that. Can he get back in somewhere, or does he become a broadcaster? And uh, Bill Waters, you know, was a broadcaster, went in, you know, went out. So, so I uh, – you, you, and you know what, and whatever you're fans of it, whatever fan in any sport we all love, our passion is being a general manager of those teams we're fans of. So, you know, I do miss the living and dying with the team. And then I also don't miss the living and dying with the team, you know? And mm-hmm. so, but, but if in a perfect world, if one kick had come out at it, but I, I look back and I said, like, I'm ridiculously fortunate, like the Toronto Maple Leafs, like everything sucks after that. Like I, I, you know, like, you know, people are coming out and say sports management, I'll work at Columbus and Carolina or Florida or Arizona. And, and that's, I, I get it. That's what you should want to do. And I go, I'm spoiled. I'm spoiled. Like I'm Ernie, the TV repairman son. And I end up working with the Leafs through like a lot, what a series of events and, and, and nothing compares and nothing compares to me in, in sports media in the Toronto area uh, as well. So that's where I'm really happy that, that it's here. Just to stay on that topic for a second, um, back I want to take you back to 1988-89. And, um, a guy who I got to know very well when I worked at Leafs TV uh, as a scout for the for the Leafs, uh, George Armstrong, of course, passed away a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I want to hear the story, Gord. You brought him in to replace Brophy, if I'm not mistaken, in that season. It must have been a, a wild time. And I, I never really pictured, like even, I never knew George back then, but I never pictured him even wanting to be a coach since I talked to him uh, in his later years. What was that like talking to him and, and getting him to coach the Maple Leafs? Well, the, 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 he, he didn't want to coach the Maple Leafs, and, and Harold Ballard would only let me make the change of moving John Brophy if George Armstrong took it. So he did it as a, he did it as a favor and, and, and that, but it's, um, uh, it's as much uh, Damian Cox and I, God, how many years ago was it? About 18 years ago now, we did a book on the 67 Leaf team. And it, it's a great book. I'm not saying just, you know, because Damien's a great writer. It was a great collaboration in that. And, and I'm very, very proud of the finished product. Um, you know, I could remember it a little bit. And I'm passionate about it. And I talk to the players. Damien could be objective. 
Uh, he's a better writer. You know, we took our turns about writing, but I got to chat with all of them, every single player. And I talked to the Horton family and the Sawchuck family. Those were the only two that had passed on then to a, to a man. They talked about the, the 67 team, but also the, the four Stanley cups in seven years. You don't win them without the goaltending of Johnny Bauer and the leadership of George Armstrong. Mm-hmm. And so I'd always this, this kind of understated leadership. So I got to know him when I started working there part-time in the seventies. Uh, people don't realize that he was supposed to co- He coached the Toronto Marvels. You know, he had those mm-hmm. great teams with Mark Howe and all those. He was actually supposed to coach the Maple Leafs in 1977. And that's why they selected John Anderson and Trevor Johansson. They had two first round picks. They selected two Toronto Marlies. And so it's a little known thing. And of course, he couldn't get a contract out of Ballard with the appropriate money. So Ballard got pissed and it kind of just went and Roger Nielsen became the coach. And then as happens, Ballard makes your life so miserable that George left the organization and worked with the Quebec Nordiques for a number of years. So I was really proud and pleased because I would run into him all the time to be able to bring him back. It, the expectation wasn't about him coaching, but he knew the, you know, the Harold Ballard circus and how it went. And, it, you know, it wasn't the proper resolution for the for the team. But I, I can never knock Mr. Ballard because if it was an unusual situation, there's no way I'm working there. Or I'm general manager. You know, so I um, I revered George Armstrong. I revered George Armstrong. He was a, a modest guy, funny, <laughs> funny guy, you know, very proud guy, but did not like the spotlight at all. And that, and uh, so he had a great life. He had a great life, and uh, I, uh, I was sad, but I, I smiled a whole lot when I, when I reflected on George Armstrong memories. We'll take a quick break here on the show, but stay tuned. We will be back with more from NHL Morning Show host on NHL Network Sirius XM, Gord Stelic, here on MWO Sports, brought to you by CoolBet.co. This is MWO Sports. Gord, um, looking ahead for, you know, what the Leafs have to go through through the North Division, if they're able to crack that, um, just want to tap your brain about the rest of the league and how they look and what fans can expect as the season uh, continues its, I guess, shortened run. You know, Steve, what's interesting right now, and, and Toronto's kind of doing in the North, is the have and the have-nots, right? Like, you've got... Like you look at the records of teams and you go like, like, what is this? They're, they're playing like 900 hockey, you know, Vegas, another example. And you look at the way Boston's playing and Tampa Bay's playing and, you know, all these kind of teams. So it's, uh, uh, it, it, I, I, I don't know if that's the way it's going to go. I mean, Ottawa, Detroit are where you thought they were. Are Los Angeles and Nashville going to join them and Vancouver, you know, as though those kind of teams that way, but for now, and I'll, and I'll go back to Steve, where I started is, it's not just the Canadian teams I'm loving the hockey. Like I had Jeff Blair say that to the other day. He's, he's, not a, he's not a hockey guy. Chris Johnston is a hockey guy, but they both said, I'm watching more hockey I'm ever watching. Like I'm PVR in games, like, and, and, and I'm finding the same. So like the Boston Bruins, are they going to tie it again when they're three down in the last minute of play? You know, that kind of intrigue. So I'm, uh, I'm really loving watching all that's going on. So the marquee teams at the end of the year are, are, you know, Tampa Bay for sure. You know, Vegas, they've talked about it. I think Colorado is that is that big mystery team. I don't think any Canadian team is viewed as a, including the Toronto Maple Leafs, is, is viewed as a favorite to actually win the Stanley Cup. I think it's one of those other ones. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm loving watching uh, the, the usual suspects and I guess adding Colorado to the mix as far as uh, uh, people that are pick, picking teams to win the Stanley Cup. Well, that'll make producer Adam very happy uh, as we continue to chat with uh, morning host on NHL Network Radio on Sirius XM, Gord Stelic, and of course, a former general manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Gord, you brought this up earlier and obviously Brian Burke uh, leaving Sportsnet to go become the president of Hockey Ops for the Pittsburgh Penguins. And he joins Ron Hextall in, I would say, one of the weirder general manager swaps. I mean, it's not like they traded him, but he, he started you know, in LA, he moves to his beloved Philadelphia Flyers. Things ended acrimoniously. And now he's back in state with Pittsburgh. First off, what did you make of the hires and of Jim Rutherford leaving? And secondly, just how attractive is that job right now? Because we all know about Sid. We all know about Gino. 
They don't have very good goaltending. They don't have any picks. They have by far the worst prospect pool in pro hockey. That's an awful lot of heavy lifting for these two guys. What did you make of the moves and what do they need to do to get Pittsburgh in a position to start building back up again? So, Ryan, you sound like Brian Burke, the broadcaster, and now he switched that the last three days. All of a sudden, everything's great in Pittsburgh, according to him. Yeah. He also says it's the greatest sports town in the world. I don't know. Has he been to oh. Boston or Chicago or even Toronto? Anyway, whatever. Yeah, I don't that's, know about that's Berkey. That. That's Berkey. So, uh, first, Jim Rutherford was a real surprise, and it was good to hear it wasn't health reasons, but it was legit. He thought his, his, uh, his power was being usurped a little bit, challenged, so he stepped away. They also thought, you know what? We do not want someone to be as powerful as Jim Rutherford. We want to do like most teams are doing Brendan Shanahan and Kyle Dubas in Toronto, like a, a general manager, a general manager and a president. And uh, I was very surprised about Ryan Burke was not surprised about Ron Hextall. You know, uh, he, it was a bitter, like he, Paul Holmgren turned on him. They were buddies and um, he turned on him. And that was, uh, you know, um, a real bitter firing and Chuck Fletcher reaped the benefits, but Ron Hextall's template is still there. So he is, he to me now, Ryan is the guy that's in tough because to your point, I agree with all your points. I'm going to stick where Berkey was three weeks ago about Pittsburgh. You know, I know they want to parade right now. That's great to say, but uh, I'm with you that that's going to be a tough animal. Berkey's case is easier because he's such a larger life personality. And, you know, people are thinking him buddies with Sid and doing, well, no, this is like what he did in Calgary. You know, Calgary was not general manager, and he brought Brad Drew Living in as the general manager, and Berkey was the president, kind of oversaw it, and then eventually, you know, I wouldn't say Ward was welcome, but the position did in that. And I, I and I can just see that that being a bit more, that as much as he's getting as much media as uh, as Ron Hextall is right now, I mean, Hex, he's going to be, Hextall's going to be the guy. But I'm happy for Brian. I mean, we're going to miss him in media, uh, but, uh, uh, but, you know, and, and the other the other part is, it's funny friendships. He's friends with so many people. And the uh, Penguin owner and him were part of the negotiation team in 2012. They had the half-season lockout. And uh, if you remember, uh, he, Berkey got fired on the eve of the Leafs' first game in the 48-game abbreviated season. And what actually happened was in the summer, uh, George Cope, who was the, who I think still is the head of uh, Bell Globe, but anyway, with their ownership, he, he got – he got mad at Berkey for whatever reason, wanted to fire him, and that was his right to do it. But the NHL said, well, hold on. He's with our negotiation team. Like it was only like it was a very small team, what, four, five, six people. So he had to stay for about five months. And that's why then, because it was curious when they fired him, but that's why. And one of the other guys on that was the Penguin, the Penguin's owner. So he forged a positive relationship. Gord, I want to ask you one more thing here uh, before we let Clarkie probably ask something else about the Maple Leafs. Um, I just want to know, in, in your time as a general manager and executive in hockey, your whole time watching this great game, you know, I know that we all kind of signed up for a weird year here. I mean, shortened season. We all are very familiar with pandemic life now. No fans in a majority of buildings. That's going to change soon. Um but I want to ask you specifically about a situation that we encountered as hockey fans on the weekend. And that was in Columbus. And I'm not talking about the benching. The, the goal that occurred in the Carolina Columbus game where the, it was clearly offside. The NHL came out after said there was a miscommunication with the goal judge and they ended up counting Vincent Trocek's goal, but they, then they took away the penalty for the challenge it was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen in my life. Have you ever encountered a situation like that in your time as a manager or just being an executive? And what did you make of the situation? Because it was one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen. Well, you know, my time, there wasn't video replay. So that right. thing would, wouldn't have entered into it. But, uh, you know, first, I love Col Coley Campbell is a stand-up guy. Colin Campbell is a stand-up guy. And a worse one was... And he stood up for it the next day and they changed the rules was that game seven Vegas and San Jose, right? Where they, yeah. you know, and, and the next day he, he stood up and they changed the rule that you have to review it. If you have a major, they get the chance to re review it because those officials wanted to, I mean, it was a difference between Vegas potentially win not winning the Stanley cup, you know, this year. So this one was relatively minor the way it went. And I also like, they didn't throw the junior guy under the bus like it. Yeah. So it's, it, it, it sounds like, a perfect storm in that, you know, some person who's handling the microphone is a, 
probably a homer looking at it and made a comment which got picked up by the referees thinking it came from the war room and then because we're in COVID era instead of being able to you know yelling at the guys in the headset they're wiping them down which normally they'd be able to get the referees back there so I do agree in the intermission that as an olive branch, he said, we're going to eliminate the 34 seconds on the penalty because we made the wrong call. But there is that sanctimonious thing. Once the puck drops, does not matter. Once the puck drops, and that's why quite often I always, you know, you see teams hustling to get that puck drop if they think something's a little dodgy. Um, the goal is sanctimonious. And, of course, Ryan, wouldn't you know, it's a one-goal game, right? Isn't that the way life works? You kind of go after that. You're, You know, if you're Coldy Campbell or whatever, you're going, please make it a five-goal blow, and I don't care who wins, but – as uh, as Murphy's law would be, it's one cool game, and it always seems to be against Columbus. Like, they, didn't they have something last year with the time clock or something too? It cost them a game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the The clock froze on point four seconds, and Drew Doughty scored an OT winner. That yeah. I mean, that's just a tough. And their goalie got injured. And their goalie got injured. Right. That's, right. What Tor- yes. that's what Tortor. That's what Tortorella was pissed about. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Yeah. Salo, that's yeah. right. Clarky, go ahead. Yeah, no, I just I wanted to ask about COVID, and it, we're we're pretty good up here in the North Division. Uh, no games have been missed. I heard there's some rumblings um, west, I guess, right now. But Gord, there's some teams obviously in the in the states that are having trouble. Do you think they're gonna like? Will they have to pair the schedule back? Like, do you know what's going on? And do you obviously they have a plan? I'm not asking yeah. you to, to tell me the plan because uh, I wouldn't think you would, even if you knew. But what do you think might happen? Clarky, first of all, what was the name of that furry animal, the ice show, whatever? Charles Barkley went one-on-one that. And we got, I had him in studio, whatever, at your behest to get tickets for everybody, whatever. And he wouldn't talk, and he he wouldn't, what's the name of the one-on-one, the big, uh, the purple, Barney. 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 Yeah, he did my voicemail for home, and I had to get it off there because I had hundreds of people calling me because he did a personalized voicemail. Okay, but yeah, Barney. Yeah, Barney. But I owe you. You said I'm filling in for McCowan, and you go look, uh, Barney, and the show's here, and we can get tickets for everybody. If uh, okay, so that I remember Charles Barkley went one on one with Barney on Saturday Night Live, so have some fun this way. So a regular guy like any of us comes in, nice guy chats, but will not go out of character. So when then when then we go back on the air. He's not where he talks like Barney and we go nowhere. We got free tickets, but it was a long, long segment. Anyway, um, you know, what yeah, you're ripping me or something here. Yeah, what, yeah. Like, what are you getting well, on here? <laughs> I got some, I got some of the tickets too, but I still have armpit sweat from that longest uh, segment. I know. You know what? Yeah. Hey, sometimes you roll the dice and you gotta, you gotta, uh, you know what? Like, let's talk about this for a second. You know, when you're in radio and you roll the dice and you do something, um, the best thing is probably to stop it and get out of it. And I'll remember, um, to totally change topics. One one thing that I did wrong at the fan when I was the assistant PD is you remember the Ben Johnson lawyers? We had them on the air and they were absolutely awful. And I said, We started it, we're ending it. That was a mistake, too. You gotta yeah. you gotta adjust, right? You gotta adjust on the fly. Yeah. And that's what I learned yeah. over time. But well, you you learn things, right? You gotta yeah. you're gonna make mistakes if you roll the dice and do stuff, but yeah, well, it was fun. No, they were fun. And it was always theater of the minds that way. Now, yeah. this is serious in 2021, as you mentioned. And uh yeah, w- will every team end up playing the 56 games? Good chance they don't, but the the one good part, if you want to call it that, because keep in mind last year it went to winning percentage. Like what did the Buffalo Sabres lose by like 0.005%. Yeah. So it yeah. did go to yeah. winning percentage there. There is, it's not like it's without precedent, but also the teams that are getting impacted are all in the same division. Right. So, so there's a fairness there. Like it, it would be worse if there was, you know, one and then another, some of the other division got impacted on the percentage thing. Cause he didn't play each other this year, whatever. So I, Hey, the NFL finished their season. God bless them. Uh, you know, the NA- NBA and NHL did it in a bubble, Major League Baseball. They pulled a player in the World Series winning game. I mean, this is the, what the world is right now. And, uh, to, you know, and, and there's a delay tonight, the Montreal Edmonton game. And I, I believe they have provided enough runway that they'll get all the games in, I believe. But also, if they're half some, they can't. And, and I think at the end of the year, too, they'll look at games that don't matter so much. And things mm. that don't matter if teams are really comfortably in the playoffs mm. or really uncomfortably out of the playoffs. So they have that flexibility as well. So I'm fine with getting through it. They're doing the best they can. I think they're doing a great job. And uh, yeah, and if it comes down to winning percentage, that's fine. They already did it. You want to It'll talk about fishing and challenge. yellow knife now? 
<laughs> yeah, go ahead. Share this, share this yellow knife no. story to end it off, Clarky. Why not? <laughs> Well, no, Gordon and I had a chance to go uh, take part in a midnight golf classic. We had this guy who uh, would always call into the fan um, that lived in Yellowknife and listened to us online. And he called one day and uh, asked if we wanted to go up there. And Gord, Gord was the MC of the golf tournament, and I got to just tag along. Um, and we went fishing, and I caught a big fish, and it's mounted in my basement. And uh, we played golf in the dark. It was supposed to be light, but it was cloudy, and it was dark. But we teed off at midnight, which was yeah. kind of cool. Yeah, the longest day of the year, June 21st. I, I never thought I'd hear fasten your seatbelts were landing in Yellowknife. And uh, uh, it was – so that was a nine-hole course, and you um, – th it's artificial turf tee-off area, artificial turf greens, and then sand. And you have a piece of artificial turf that you take to put your golf ball on. So they gave us a couple of people to help because it was pitch black. Clarky and I still have the black fly bug repellent oh. on us. It would just – so anyway, it was – a it. And it was a fun night, and then but we were there for three or four days. So the, so there were some okay parts, but it got a little long at the end. But the fishing trip was nice, and Clarky Clarky landed the big one like uh, the old American Sportsman Show with Kurt Gowdy or, or uh, uh, Henry and Italo, whatever it may be, one of those. Fishing in a shows. canoe, Ryan. In a canoe, we were in canoes. Anyway, and you know why? It took it took up our freezer. After that, we had no ice for the, the for the mixed drinks and the and the beer because Clarky's big fish took up the freezer. But anyway, and I put it, was, it in my golf bag and brought it back. Yeah, absolutely. And then we went on the air in the fan and got got it mounted for free. Remember the guy Brains uh, Taxi Jeff Brain. Yeah. I told Clarky because Brad Smith, Motor City Smitty, said he did a promotion at a guy in Aurelia, Ontario, Jeff Brain Taxidermist. And sure enough, like Clarky has a nose for value, so do I. So. We got connected with the guy and he got it stuffed. So there we go. Game, yep. set, match. Unbelievable. Jeff Brain, what a name. That's fantastic. Good yeah. for you, Clarky. I've seen the fish. Yeah. It's very impressive. Well done. Gord, we really appreciate you doing this, buddy. Uh, we appreciate all the work that you're doing. Keep it up and uh, stay safe down there. We really appreciate it. You guys stay safe as well and uh, real pleasure. And Chris, you're a great friend. We go way, way back. And guys, it's fun. This is a real good show, a lot of fun. So anytime down the road, okay? Absolutely. We appreciate it. You'll definitely be back. My, uh, friend of the show, mark it down. Keep us in the calendar. All right, we'll take another quick break here on MWO Sports, brought to you by CoolBet.co. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit about, about baseball. Trevor Bauer signing the biggest single season deal in Major League Baseball history. And of course, we have to talk about the Super Bowl with our buddy Chris Abbott from CoolBet. Stay tuned. This is MWO Sports. Welcome back to MWO Sports, brought to you by CoolBet.co. Ryan Drury still alongside Clarky and Steve Sabern. We are, of course, joined, as always, at the end of the show by our buddy Chris Abbott from CoolBet. Chris, how you doing, buddy? How was the Super Bowl? Hey guys, how's it going? Yeah, no, doing doing great. And the Super Bowl was phenomenal for me. Um, if you if you wind back the tape, it'll it'll sound like I knew what was going to happen before the game happened. So I'll take that. That that doesn't always play out uh, as nicely as it did for me in the Super Bowl. But the teaser hit, uh, no questions asked. The the Bucks money line had a little bit there. Gronk was a huge factor. Uh, you know, I was talking about Antonio Brown all playoffs, that he would be a factor. I didn't know that uh, his touchdown prop would also cash, so that was great. I didn't have that. But, um, yeah, the guys who who were, you know, the freebies for Tampa Bay in Gronk and Antonio Brown and, and Leonard Fournette, they, they were all huge factors. It, you know, this is amazing that, you know, just have a little bit of money on a game and you can make a crappy, crappy game exciting, can't you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that happens all the time throughout the season. In fact, in the NHL, it's happening right now uh, frequently in the Central Division because there's a whole lot of bad games being played in there. But uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. It pays. Uh, it pays nonetheless. So, uh, yeah, I agree. The Super Bowl was not uh, it was not that fun to watch. Um, even like even though my bets were winning, they weren't even like in question. Like you didn't even get the adrenaline rush of like, is this or is this not going to happen? So, yeah, I, I completely understand uh, those people out there who uh, weren't enamored with the Super Bowl. It was all bucks all the way. 
Yeah, they uh, Kansas City played uh, probably the worst game I've ever seen them play in the Patrick Mahomes era. And I mean, the numbers bear that out. Lowest point total since he took over his quarterback. It's actually the lowest point total of his quarterbacking career. He never scored nine or fewer points in college even. And it was the largest margin of loss in his entire career, including college. I mean, that poor guy was running all over the place. We know he had turf toe, but man, oh man, the impacts on that offensive line really showed. And like you said, Chris, and you're right, wind the tape back. That's why you watch this show and trust what Chris says. You had it, man. Uh, Tampa Bay was going to eke this thing out. And I mean, they didn't even eke it out. They dummied them by three possessions. And I actually took your advice. I had Tampa Bay on the money line. I had them to win and under 55. I mean, just about everything I bet on hit. And so I'll, I'll thank you for that. Your impression of the game and just what went wrong for Kansas city. I mean, of course their offensive line played poorly, but man, they had some offensive players like Travis Kelsey in particular that just played awful and gave them nothing. Yeah. I mean, so I do think there's something to the fact that Kansas city was flagged an awful lot in crucial moments early on and, and penalties, really went the way of the Buccaneers in this game. I, I don't think that's a, I don't think that's really an argument to be made. I think that was, that was quite obvious. Tampa Bay didn't take as many penalties and, and it certainly helped at the end, but yeah, if your offensive line is just continuously letting the pass rush through and, and we, we saw Mahomes, he, he playing, you know, injured for him to escape as much as he did and still get some of those throws away that, you know, hit guys in the mask or were dropped you know, I, I don't put any of the loss on Patrick Mahomes, not at all, uh, even though they did not score a touchdown, which I don't think, you know, you could have predicted. Although I did see someone out there somewhere had uh, picked the exact number of points for Kansas City at nine, and I think it paid like 30 to one or something like that, like a ridiculous bet. But yeah, it's uh, it was uh, it was a game where Tampa's defense dominated. I knew they'd be a factor. I didn't know they'd be as dominant as they were. But hey, and you you bring a team that doesn't have its best offensive line, uh, and you're in trouble. And it really is glaring. You know, the linemen don't get enough credit uh, for wins and or losses. But that's where the game is won and lost at the line of scrimmage. The, the playmakers get all the focus. But if you have an offensive line that's unable to do its job, the, that's going to be the result nine times out of 10. Well, Chris, it's interesting too, because when you look at the buildup to the Super Bowl, Tampa Bay, I would argue over on the NFC side, was probably down the list of making it that far compared to a KC, which was expected to be there. And you could just see the confidence through the playoffs of Tampa and even through the game at stages that once Gronk scored, uh, caught that first touchdown, they just had a whole weight lift off their shoulders. Yeah, there's something to the mystique of of Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski when it comes to these games. Like they haven't won all those rings by accident. So once they are able to have that success, then it's not surprising to me that the team just just felt probably invincible out there on the field, and everything they were doing was was working out and going uh, in their in their favor. You play this game, you know, ten times. It'd be interesting to see who wins, uh, how many games. But uh, on that night, for, for certain, uh, I don't think it was ever in doubt that Tampa Bay was going to win the game, especially, you know, after the first quarter. And that's all that matters at the end of the day, right? You show up to play, uh, winner takes all. And old Tommy, old washed up, 43-year-old, dusty, can't throw the ball anymore, broken down Tommy, does it again. And uh, me personally, I'm, I'm a diehard Patriots fan. He has supplied me with plenty of great memories over the years. I, am ex I don't think I've ever been so happy for somebody not winning for my team as I was for Tom. Uh, I, I think it's without question now Chris and I'd love your take on this uh, and, and fellas you guys as well I, I think there's no question he's the greatest football player of all time if you want to talk to me about Lawrence Taylor and guys like that I, I'd accept that argument uh, the other side of the ball of course no doubt about it by far the greatest quarterback of all time I don't ever want to hear the name Peyton Manning again as much as I love Peyton he's going to go to the Hall of Fame of course this year I don't ever want to hear about Joe Montana all due respect to him Tom Brady's hero Steve Young Troy Aikman Brett Favre, I don't ever want to hear these guys' names again. They all fall below Tom Brady. But it sparked an interesting debate here. And, and it kind of started after the sixth one. And it's crazy we're talking about seven. But now that he's done it without old Uncle Bill, and he's done it without the Patriot way, if you will, 
Do you buy into him being the greatest athlete in North American pro sports history? Because Chris, frankly, I don't. If you a uh, Tom Brady, I think himself would tell you he's not a great athlete. Quarterback, absolutely. Athlete, I think that's a stretch. What's your take on that? No, I don't think he's the best athlete on his team. You know, like uh, yeah, or, yeah. or that he ever was the best athlete on his team, and. I, I don't think there's any doubt that he'll go down as the greatest football player ever, but he's not actually the greatest football player ever. He's the best winner ever. He's the best clutch football player ever. Um, mm. He's arguably the best leader of men when it comes to being on the field ever, but I don't think he's the best physically gifted football player. Not by, I don't know if he's even in the top 10, you know, like he gets no way. it done. He gets it done, but in terms of athleticism, there's nothing that Tom Brady does that is remarkable athletically. But the way he, the way he is always there at the end of the day, the way he always steps up in the big moment, um, that that says an awful lot. So, is he the greatest ever to do it? Yeah, he's won the Super Bowl seven times. But is he the, you know, the, does he have the best arm? No. Is he the most accurate? No. You know, <laughs> but he's got it done. So I guess that's all that matters. Yeah, there's something to be said for that. Guys, I'd, I'd be curious. Steve, I'll start with you. I mean, who, who would come to mind? I mean, it's a hard conversation to have. There's so many arguments you can make for so many guys. Sports are so very de- – hockey's not like football, for instance. Well, I mean, that, that's – For you. Well, and that ends the argument there is, I mean, you take a sport like hockey, which is fluid. Football is a start and stop sport. You get to reset after every play, right? You get to recompose. Hockey is so fluid – that the puck is always in play and moving back and forth. And there's different dynamics to all the sports. Um, You know, you could talk about reaction time. Well, the guys who hit a ball 425 feet out of a yard have to have the best reaction time in any sport. And that's just, you know, that's just fact, right? That's a stopwatch. Um, So, yeah, Tom Brady, uh, the best quarterback, absolutely. Absolutely the way he's able to control the game and the, it's proven by the number of championships and the quarterback is a leadership role on a team. Um, but yeah, from a greatest athlete of all time, I don't think that's uh, something you could peg down at all. Yeah, I don't think so. There's too many to name. I mean, you think Bo Jackson, Muhammad Ali, I mean, you know, there's just way too many guys you could name across. Well, what about Tiger Woods? Tiger, yeah, Tiger, yeah, I don't know. He's a golfer. I don't know if I can, <laughs> like, he'd be in the winner category for me athletically. I don't know, like, when you're talking, like, Usain Bolt, Michael Phelps, Serena Williams. I, I mean, Messi oh, yeah. and Ronaldo, I don't know. There's too many to pick, right? I mean. Here's here's the way I look at it. Put Tom Brady in the, uh, the uh, American Gladiators, like, final challenge head-to-head against DK Metcalf and see who comes out on top, put him head to head against Serena Williams and see who comes out on top. Probably Serena. Um, You know, so uh, it's, it's, it's two different conversations, I think. Right. I I don't even think Tom Brady himself would tell you he's the most athletically gifted, but did he persevere? Was he a late draft pick? Is his attention to detail there? All those things. Yes. Check, check, check. But um, I, yeah, I think we're all in agreement that, you know, from a physical specimen uh perspective no i don't think you could you could have him up there like you said imagine if he did a uh something against usain bolt when it came to like you know physical athleticism competition i would like to see the tom brady chris clark gladiator final i think that would be a evenly matched competition Oh, I don't know. You might be giving Clarky a wee bit too much credit there. <laughs> was there um, any betting on the uh, the parade and what would happen there if the Lombardi was going to sink or not? Was there anything there, Chris? Or <laughs> Well, had we known how it was going to play out, we sure would have had some betting markets on there. But, I mean, listen, everyone's getting on Tom for getting drunk. Like, hats off to him. I love yeah. it. <laughs> Come it was on. Fantastic. Yeah, like, like, that was awesome. He's He actually appeared to be human, uh, you know. <laughs> What what middle aged white guy hasn't gotten wasted in Florida? So like, <laughs> but I think it's great. I or did California. too. I, oh, over under on avocado tequila shots he took. We'll set it at nine and a half. Uh, really quick, Chris, I want to ask you about Trevor Bauer signing the single biggest season 
payout in MLB history. He's going to get $40 million from the LA Dodgers next year. Three-year deal. He can option out after each of the first two. First of all, it, do you feel he's worth that? And second off, does that cement them as repeat champions for you? Or who would you lay money on in terms of futures on a World Series next year? Yeah, um, I'll start with the second question first. I mean, yeah, I think they're definitely going to be the team to beat. Their their staff and their lineup is, is phenomenal. Um, do I think he's worth it? I think Trevor Bauer has Conor McGregor'd his way into an unbelievable payout through the use of social media. And I don't begrudge him for it. But I think if you look at, you know, his numbers and his performance versus the persona that is Trevor Bauer, the Los Angeles Dodgers, and I guess whoever else were in the running, uh, certainly overpaid for what they're going to get, you know, between the white lines. I think that's how I, that's how I view it. I'm a Trevor Bauer fan. I like what he does. Um, he's a good pitcher. Like he's, he is a good pitcher. But um, yeah, that's that's a big ticket. Considering I think they got Walker Bueller for eight million. Wow. Yeah, that's a bit of better business, I would it, say for sure. Clarky, go ahead. Before we go, um, guys, we did our hockey pool obviously at the beginning of the year, and I did some stats up because I think we need to keep track of this. Yeah. Um, Chris, your two hundred bucks uh, looks pretty good for uh, Steve finishing in last. But I think <laughs> producer Adam has the stats. If we could, there they are, boys. Wow, she's tight. Big Connor's helping me out. So Clarky, uh. four, sixty-one points. Drury and Chris tied at forty-eight, and Steve at forty-five. Wow. So I have forty-five points. Well, Can Austin's on fire, man. Well, considering Eichel hasn't played last, since last century and yeah. Aho has been, you know, sitting out uh, in canceled games, two major forwards and I'm only three points behind. That's pretty good. Now, yeah, if only you, Freddie can get me a couple shutouts, I might yeah, find I the ladder. I do think that's pretty good. I forget who I even had. Patrick Kane, for sure. Patrick um, Kane, Nate McKinnon and Sydney. Okay, yeah. Well, Nate's been sitting out for a long time. Uh, Sid might be the uh, Achilles heel of that uh, of that roster because the Penguins, I got uh, what's going on there. I I, I mean, I, I know we're, we're short on time, but I can see Malkin getting dealt now that the new uh, regime is in. I could see that team getting blown up over the next 12 days. God, months. I don't know, man. I think that's what Jimmy Rutherford wanted to do and they wouldn't let him do it. Oh, you might be right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. If it's one of them, I think it'll be Gino. I agree. And I'll make my excuses now. He's been letting me down. You never know what you're going to get out of Winnipeg, but Connor Halibut's been good for me. And uh, Ovi has been sitting out due to COVID reasons as well. So yeah. I'll catch up. I'll catch up. Don't worry. Markstrom, Ovi always goes on a heater. Chris has Markstrom, and he's the only guy with uh, with shutouts of That's uh, right. four goalies. So shout yeah. out to there. And and Calgary's had some had some tough luck, I think, uh, with it when it comes to results. I think they're going to be a team to there's we all thought they'd be good in the preseason. I think they're still going to be there at the end of the day. But hey, Clark, your Leafs, man, like they are they're playing unbelievable hockey. Uh, the game against Montreal in Montreal the other night when they were up three one and they, they stared that ship home. Like yep. that to me, that was that was rare for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Like that game uh, for the last five six years goes to overtime for sure. Um, <laughs> right. And yeah, so you know, even this even the second Montreal goal was just really bad giveaways by Riley and Brody. Like not not um, not certainly indicative of how they usually play. So I was really impressed with the way they they brought that game home the other night. Yeah, yeah, and and the way like Dermot's goal, the way they just dominated the offensive zone for what seemed to be over a minute. Uh, Montreal three or four times having the puck and the least four checking, just killing them. Even Willie Nylander uh, did some good work there. So anyway, yes. So we'll we'll take a look. Uh, I guess monthly at the stats, or at least uh, every time I'm in first place, we'll take a look at them. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly how it works. Yeah. Well, we're done pumping your Leafs tires. Clarky's going to walk away three inches taller from this show. So that's always great news, Chris. We appreciate it, buddy. Uh, we enjoyed the Super Bowl, as boring as it was. Uh, it was fun <laughs> to win some money, and hopefully, uh, that's a signal for people to start listening to your advice if they're not already. We appreciate it, buddy. Oh, it's a fickle mistress. I go on uh, cold streaks and hot streaks, as you as you well know. So uh, hopefully, this is the the sign of something prolonged here. 
Absolutely. Don't hate the player, hate the game. Am I right? All right. We will say goodbye for this week on MWO Sports brought to you by CoolBet.co. We appreciate our buddy Gord Stalick and, of course, Chris Abbott for joining us this week. You can listen to this show Fridays just after 6 on CKNX AM 920 and stream it on CKNX.ca. Unless the Leafs play at 7 on a Friday night, we will start at 5.30 leading into Leafs pregame at 6.30. We're on YouTube now as well. You can find us there. Follow us on social media at MWO underscore sports and of course you can find the podcast on all the best podcast apps i'm ryan drury that's clarky that is steve sabrin remember you can also watch the show with our friends and producer adam the colorado avalanche fan friday nights at eight sunday nights at nine on whiteman tv we'll see you next week (laughs) 